And I wanted to take a minute and discuss a little bit, um, not so much about the art, but about the environment in which the art, I think, is, is functioning in real time right now. And one of the reasons I think that uh, this artwork is so interesting is because of everything that is going on globally. So I just wanted to walk through a few of the, of the macro level dimensions and then we'll kind of, kind of begin to dig into the art conversation a little bit if that works for everybody. Um, art historically has been an important medium to address important social topics such as death, sexuality, poverty, and immigration, which of course is the focus of today's discussion. Art communicates with us in ways that the world fails to, and it reminds us there are a number of different ways of thinking about the challenges that face us. As you saw from the excellent work of Mario, there are a number of different ways of thinking about immigration. And here are a few things that are, are happening at the global level I think that are important to talk about. The number of displaced persons globally is at an all-time high. 65.3 million people are displaced. This is more displaced people than at any point in history, in global history. One in 113 people globally are displaced. So if we had 113 people in this room, one of you would be displaced right now. So a large number of people moving back and forth, not because they want to, but because they have to. Forced displacement has been on the rise since at least the mid-1990s in most regions, but over the fa past five years it has increased. And there are three reasons for this primarily. The conflicts and causes of large refugee flows from places like Somalia and Afghanistan are now in their third and fourth decade, respectively, and these conflicts and the reasons for them are lasting longer than ever. As you know, um, right now there are many things going on in Syria. There's a very terrible civil war, and the major countries right now sending refugees include Syria, South Sudan, Yemen, Burundi, Ukraine, and the Central African Republic. And the rate at which solutions are being found for refugees and internally displaced people has been on a falling trend since the end of the Cold War, leaving a growing number of people in limbo. Some have been in refugee camps for decades. Countries are also becoming increasingly resistant to receiving immigrants and refugees, with populist movements in the United States and Britain reflecting this. Even though statistics show that immigration to some countries, like Mexican immigration to the United States, is actually on the decline. And it's against this backdrop that we will begin our discussion. Mario, this first set of questions is for you. And to be honest with you, you're not constrained to the question. I really expect you would just kind of work with it as you go along. Um, but I'm going to give you a few things to, to work with. Um, can you tell us a little bit of how your personal experience is, is reflected in your art? Whoa. <laughs> um, well, I think that, well, I hope that I am, um, that my art reflects who I am. So I was born in Cuba, you know, I came to this country. Um, I was raised in a very Cuban family. So this is the way I look at it. I, I was born in Cuba, I came to the United States. I, be I became a Cuban-American. I lived most of my life on the hyphen, going back and forth, trying to navigate what it was like to be um, one or the other. And it, at some point, you, you come to terms with it, and you realize that you are both. And then eventually, I'm 62 years old, so if I haven't figured it out by now, but um, hopefully, in, you know, at some point then I became what I, uh, an American. And I think it consciously hit me when I think in 2005 I went to China and then I really realized that, you know, how American I really was. Um, but I grew up in a household where my parents were very proud of where they came from. I absorbed that. That's part of who I am. And um, I hope it's reflected in my work. Um, I think that if an artist is true to themselves and they shut off all the voices, all the things that tell you what you are or aren't or uh, what you should and shouldn't be doing, if you really deep, deep, dig deep inside of you and you touch on who you are and you express that, uh, the individual that you are, that hits on the universal because in the end we're all human. So, um, you know, I think it's, it, it started out maybe being more, um, uh, 
something more visual because my earlier work was more autobiographical and it dealt more with my parents directly but um, as you might have noticed my work it's not very linear and it just goes back and forth on, on different levels it's um, so I don't know if that makes any sense but it makes a lot of sense okay. <laughs> and I'm very appreciative um, can you tell us a little bit and I hope I'm phrasing this the right way but can you talk about the role of art in shaping dialogue? So, for example, uh, your art touches up upon many themes, including immigration. Can you talk about how you see art impacting dialogue? Well, I mean, historically, the, the big art with the big A, um, you know, some, something like Picasso's Guernica that, you know, talked about this kind of injustices. Um, Mine approaches it more on a personal basis, and um, you know, you just, you really don't know. You live in a bubble, and you wonder if it makes a difference at all, and you become cynical about it. Um, and I, I really, you know, I don't know the answer to that question, but lately I've been trying to work, do things that are, um, uh, that reach out to the public in a diff in different kind of way. Um, I mean, I fought being uh, political or talking about specific things because my parents were probably uh, way too wrapped up in, in the politics of Cuba. So, um, you know, you, you kind of fight these things, but you absorb it and they become who you are. So um, I, think, I think visual art is a hard one to, to, um, to focus on. No, I think that answer is great. Uh, this was not a question I'd prepared to ask, but uh, upon seeing your art, I did want to ask this particular question. Um, I noticed that, and you explained, you gave me a personal tour for which I'm grateful, um, <laughs> just to show me different phases of the artwork. But I noticed some of your, some of the materials you use are very hard or very sharp, mm -hmm. like the glass. I think you had a little bit of ceramic in there, and it really impressed me because I came here, and there was something very delicate about this display in comparison with the other materials that you used. I just wanted to know how, how uh, why was that and was it on purpose? Um, I work real intuitively so I try not to question things and um, I just go with the with what I feel strongly about but um, as far as materials I think for me it's much more important the idea is much more important than the material um, this particular piece for me I saw as a, as a self-portrait of sorts and the outside is more kind of like what you show the world and the idea was that you, you know you choose what you show and it's more delicate and, uh, or whatever and, um, and then you come around and you see the, the interior what a person is really like and the complexities about it. But you know, I you know my my mother passed away, my father passed away. They, she did a lot of uh, uh, crocheting. Some of those are hers. I've always found them incredibly beautiful. I was dealing with pattern, and um, it just just made sense in, at some at some level. And and you know, it's a way that women were able to express their creativity. And 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 I think. Uh, for me, beauty can be, have a redemptive quality, so maybe that had something to do with it. Um, I tend to lose interest in my work when I figure it out completely. Um, that's a great line. Be beauty has a redemptive quality. Um, so Mark, I'm going to turn to you to talk about the ugly a little bit, <laughs> um, which uh, you're an experienced attorney. You've been working in the immigration field for a long time. You've been a leader in that field for many years. And I know you have a broad understanding of what's happening in the U.S. in general, and Georgia in particular, with regards to immigrant-related policy. So can you talk a little bit about the trends you see, state policy, law enforcement, and that kind of thing, just to give us a picture now that we understand a little bit about the art that's highlighting the immigration question? Well, David, I could, but I think I would bore this crowd to tears. Let me start by, and I'll get back to that then, but let me start by saying that Mario and I don't know each other. We don't know each other. We've never met. 
but we are both the same age. Uh, I'm the son of a Cuban mother. I had the uh, accidental fortune of being born in the U.S., but I spent my first five summers in Havana. Uh, and then that was the end of that when Fidel Castro came to power. I had not been back to Cuba for 50 some odd years, uh, 55 years, and I went two years ago with a delegation from Atlanta. And I talked to a few folks who had been to Cuba around that time, and one was Michael Shapiro, the then director of the High Art Museum. And I said, Michael, what would you think? He said, well, it was really amazing. He said, when you go there, you have to go to the art faculty campus, which was the Havana Country Club in the old days. Because if you go there, the faculty members have their art there to show and to sell. So that's interesting. So I spent a week in Cuba trying to get to the old Havana Country Club without success. But I did discover a few things about art in Cuba. Number one, the, probably the only group of professionals, people that actually could still make money in all of Cuba from the time of the revolution until now, who were allowed to actually continue their profession, sell their works, and Americans could bring them to the US, there was no embargo, was on art. Now say what you will about Fidel Castro. We know having come, having grown up in Miami, having come to Miami, we don't talk about Cuban politics publicly because that is a dangerous business. But I think it's fair to say that I was shocked to learn that the artists of Cuba have, have flourished as much as they can within that type of society. But what? you know why that is? Because consciously, he decides, Fidel decides, and I, I don't know dates for sure, but he decides to use art as propaganda. And he establishes the biennials in Havana, where all of Europe comes calling, especially the Germans. So the Germans come, they buy up the work, and, and that is when the Cubans start to come in and out of Cuba, they're given permission to do that. But it's a conscious decision, and I particularly, I have a friend who worked at the National Gallery, and she said that they had no access, they had one computer, they had access. But with Fred Alam Institute, which was the, you know, the one organization that was doing all this going back and forth, they had several, and they had everything that they needed. So he lets them come out into the world. Once they see the world and things get a little fuzzy, then he starts pulling back. And that's what happens in the 80s. And this particular artist in town, um, Alejandro Aguilera, that's part of that group. So it, it, it seems, you know, he uses it as propaganda. And in a way to go out into the world and say this, you know, what, what we can do. Which is a perfect segue to tell you two things. One about that particular museum, it has very few resources. It doesn't even have enough air conditioning to properly preserve the masterworks that are there. It's simply sad, uh, but they just don't have resources. But the other thing that I found very interesting is how Cuban artists are able to work in the double meaning of art pieces. In other words, you look at the painting if you're Castro or Cubans there, and you might see one thing, but if you read what the artist has written about the piece, you realize there's a hidden meaning. And that meaning is typically very political. And there's the fine line that all Cuban artists have had to walk for over 50 years of making their art staying faithful to themselves as artists, but not going over the line where they would be put in jail. And I'll close with one other example, and that's a folk artist named Mr. Fuster. Now, Fuster is a very famous folk artist, and if you get the chance to go to Havana, there's a neighborhood where he lives, and his home, his shop is there. He has done the artistic work 
in the entire neighborhood. He has taken everybody's front garden walls, and there are these wild, it reminded me of the famous Georgia artist, uh, Finster. I was singing Finster and Fuster. And it is a remarkable collection of just art out of control. Just do as you will, uh, ceramics, uh, paintings. So I brought a piece back. I wish I would have brought it tonight, but I just flew in from, where was I? In, uh, I was in New York. I was up in Buffalo. It was not very memorable, but anyhow. Um, and the piece I bought has a domino on it. Why did I find that interesting? Because for Cubans, the game of dominoes is more than just a game. Uh, it's an art. It's a, uh, it's a way of life. It's a, it's a competition. It's uh, engaging in life for Cubans. So, well, I agree, Mario, that obviously artists have been used by the Castro government. I, I will say that it was surprising to see that they have been able to exist and thrive to some extent, uh, while all others were really, really repressed. Uh, so, now, what's happening in Georgia? Let's compare Georgia to California. When Georgia looks at immigration, we go back to 2006. We are the we were the first state in America to pass our own immigration act, and that means an enforcement act, because states cannot give any positive rights to people from other countries, only the federal government can do that. But states took it upon themselves, and this has a lot to do with politics, to become engaged in the immigration issue, and politicians use that, uh, particularly in Georgia, as an anti-immigration, as part of their campaign strategy. On the other hand, if you look at a state like California, uh, they've created their own exceptions to a number of the federal policies that are enforcement-oriented, the best example today would be the sanctuary city issue, the sanctuary state issue, where California wants to be a sanctuary state. Big cities like Los Angeles want to be sanctuary cities. And there will be a battle. There is going to be a legal battle with the federal government over that. And the state Supreme Court uh, justice, the chief justice of California, several weeks ago, issued a public statement, which he sent to the head of immigration and to the president saying do not come to our courts in california those are safe havens people need to come and have their conflicts resolved by judges by fellow jurors that live in the city of los angeles and the state of washington did the same thing shortly after that the response from the federal government was we need the local police departments to work with us so that we can catch those bad hombres, as our president likes to refer to them. Uh, but that's where the states have gone. Georgia has gone completely one way. The states like California have gone completely the other way. Thank you, that was great. Really, really, really appreciate it. Shana, I have a few questions for you as well, and please feel free again to use this as a spinal column to you know, build off of. Um, as someone who has extensively researched a variety of to topics related to refugees, including international law and human rights, can you talk about uh, a little bit about the international obligations of the United States with regards to people who are coming here in distress? Sure, I can talk about that. I also just will say I just want to thank all of you for uh, allowing a law professor and a lawyer who often speaks on panels to an audience primarily of lawyers to get to put on my CV that I got to talk at an art museum, which is pretty awesome for me. Um, but also I think it's just pretty awesome that we're all here um, really putting pressure on the ways in which art can um, foment some of these important conversations about um, about immigration, about refugees, and about some of what I think a lot of us would believe to be some of the most salient issues politically today. Um, certainly anybody who a couple years ago would have said, well, immigration law, refugee law, that's sort of a marginal 
area of the law, I think, would agree, if you look at the papers over the past couple months, that this is a critical area. Uh, and I certainly would agree with what with Mark's comments about the ways in which it's been utilized, um, when the ways in which certain immigrant groups have been, um, I would say, scapegoated, um, political, politically motivated conversations around ethnicity, identity, are certainly something that we see in the newspapers. And I think that there's really important ways that art can engage with those questions uh, and to potentially shape some of those conversations within the public context. So um, law does not have, um, have a unilateral uh, way to, is, is not the only way in which we can, we can approach some of these important questions. Um, but with regard to your question about, you know, what, what are the United States' obligations toward immigrants, towards refugees, um, why do we even, why is this even a question? Um, so the United States has signed on as a country to a number of different international law agreements, treaties and conventions, um, which obligate us as a country to respect certain rights of individuals. And there's a lot of different international law mechanisms. I don't want to get into the details of all of them, um, but which protect the universal human rights of all people in the world. Um, and more specifically, there's something called the Refugee Convention, uh, which was agreed upon and really evolved in this post-World War II era, this moment in time uh, when the global community kind of came together and looked at the failures of, um, of the global system. Uh, within about four years, three years, we had um, international human rights conventions starting to emerge, conventions to protect refugees, um, and a number of other instruments where this idea came, came to pass that international law previously had really been about state-to-state -state obligations. This idea, though, was really important that, you know, a country could and should support the people and protect the people within its, within its boundaries. But World War II really shifted the way in which the global community thought about that concept because it was clear when we saw what happened in across Europe and much of the much of the world, it really turned this idea on its head, right? There was this idea that, you know, a country would never gas and kill its own citizens. But that's exactly what happened. And so a lot of these international instruments started to emerge aware of that terrible reality. Um, in the United States, um, I think some of the, some of the important uh, ways in which we saw the United States failing at that time period, I think, have shifted and led to some of the evolution of international law and how it's played out in the United States. Um, there's a very really uh, another kind of embarrassing chapter um, in the United States' history where a boat called the USS St. Louis came to the United States and um, under Roosevelt, we as a country turned away that, that boat of Jewish refugees from, from Germany and I believe it was about 900 um, who were all um, exterminated in the in the gas chambers um, and so we have that that terrible legacy of not having done enough many times throughout our history and so some of these international law instruments have have been created and agreed upon by countries in order to try and prevent some of those problems um, unfortunately the refugee convention which is the the principal one that we might be thinking about as we think about how to protect refugees coming coming from Syria, coming from all over the world, these, this enormous population that um, David mentioned. Um, the, the Refugee Convention provides certain obligations, the most important of which is the obligation not to return someone to a country where they will face harm or mistreatment. However, you might think that that would lead to the corollary of, well, we are obligated to then bring those people into the United States to accept them, but yet we don't have that, that obligation. While we could get political will for countries to say, uh, well, if David shows up in the United States, I can't send him back to Syria if I know he will face harm. There is no obligation in that legal instrument to say, and we must allow David to stay here forever. Um, so there's, there's a, a tricky sense within the international law that, you know, 
there's a balance between these these goals of um, human rights, cosmopolitanism on the one hand, and national sovereignty and protection of our borders, a nativist uh, nation-state borders understanding of how the world works. And so I think a lot of the international law on refugees um, really is kind of in the middle of those two, two areas and creates a bit of tension with regard to that. I can talk a lot more about that, but I'll stop. So, quick question. Um, how would you assess, this is really two-part question, um, at what level would you, would you assess the average public's understanding of immigrant and refugee issues? And what role do you think art might play in changing that? Um, so with regard to public knowledge in the United States of immigrants and refugees, I think that there's a lot of misinformation. Um, there's also a lot of, um, I'm trying to think there must be some psychological term if there's a psychologist in the audience, like a, a disassociation almost. And I'm thinking, for example, of, yeah? It's, it's called uh, diffusion of responsibility. It's kind of where you don't associate like it's not your problem. Division of, of responsibility. Diffusion of responsibility. Right, so I think that's what I mean, and I'll give an example. Um, so I've been doing a lot of work recently uh, with the Southern Poverty Law Center in a number of detention centers, places where immigrants are brought when they're rounded up, when they're found to be processed and eventually, in most cases, deported. Um, and a guy showed up at the detention center to pay bond for someone who had been working for him in his construction company in outside of Columbus, Georgia. And this guy comes in and he's like, hey, you know, he's 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 not your he's not like he doesn't work for a human rights organization, right? He's kind of a guy who owns a construction company outside of Columbus, Georgia. And I'm talking to him and he tells me, well, you know, I'm coming to pay bond for this guy because like, he's my guy. Like he shows up every day on my work site. He makes my business run. Like I need him. We're friends. We're tight. Like I know his kids. He knows mine. He's not one of those guys. He's not, I never thought that he was gonna be the one to end up here getting deported. So I think that, you know, on the one hand, people don't necessarily, in the United States, they don't make the connection between the people in their lives on a daily basis who are affected by these policies. And case in point, this guy who came to pay bond for his undocumented uh, day laborer, he voted for, the government that is currently trying to deport him. So, you know, I think there's might be some, some disassociation there. Um, so that's just one, just one quick, quick point. Um, and then with regard to the question of how art connects to these issues, so in addition to having spent a lot of time working on refugee issues in Latin America, I've also spent um, about four years in the Middle East working with um, UN, the UN and also um, with Palestinian refugees. And I think often about one Palestinian artist who I got to know fairly well, um, and he described, you know, he grew up in a refugee camp, um, grew up essentially stateless, you know, with no passport, um, very limited, constricted rights. And his art was all about him doing these sort of Gabriel Garcia Marquez magical realism type of things, like, you know, flying over the ocean and um, taking a nap in in the crevice of the um, of the of a new moon and you know just like these beautiful artistic images and the way he talked about it was that he because of the constricted nature of his day-to-day -day life as a refugee he found freedom in his art in a way that he could not find in real life in the refugee camp where he where he had lived. So uh, to me, there's really um, kind of a magical quality that art, uh, which derives from the refugee experience, can evoke. And I also think a transformative one. I think if we can um, bring that spirit and energy and that's encapsulated in some of that artwork um, and, and figure out ways to, um, to share it with the broader public, 
uh, I think it, it would be really quite hard for a lot of the U.S. public to continue to have really limited notions of who refugees are, who, who immigrants actually are. Thank you. That's great. Celine. And I, I sort of want you to take this wherever you want to take it, basically. Um, but as, as a refugee and as a designer with an architectural background, You've both lived the experience, but you also work with contour and, and color and, and shape, which I think is a very artistic exercise. Can you reflect a little bit on that and just tell us about your experience and how you think about this? Yeah. Um, first of all, thank you for uh, having me here and giving me the voice to uh, express um, or talk more about the refugees um, and how our world has shaped us and um, maybe uh, not uh, voluntarily but kind of forced us to uh, follow a mold. Um, this morning I was actually thinking about uh, art and in relation to how it is in my life and I remembered all of a sudden that I had completely forgotten uh, when we were in Pakistan waiting to be resettled um, for what we thought was two months, three months, it became eight years. Um, my parents hired someone to teach us how to use pastels. And they, I had completely forgotten about it. And they, um, what, the reason they did that was for us to kind of connect back to where we came from. Uh, and they had us draw these um, mountains and uh, landscapes and uh, Nowruz, which is the, the new year in the region. Um, it, it happens on the first day of spring, March 21st, and they had us draw that using pastels. And that was a way for how art connected us back to a culture that we were kind of ripped from and that we wouldn't be able to know at all. Um, and then we uh, came here uh, after uh, be, being resettled and I, I was resettled at the age of nine and I was telling Mario how this exhibition kind of um, tells me what I've lived through and then where I'm going. So it's been, <laughs> it's a really interesting and eye-opening uh, exhibit and um, I think art plays a very important role in the life of the refugee and there was, uh, there are a lot of uh, initiatives within refugee camps by various artists um, to uh, have, give the voice back to the kids who've lost it. And they, they might not know exactly how, what they're feeling, where they are, uh, and how to express that through words. Um, a lot of them are probably born in a refugee camp. Um, a lot of them, I was born in a refugee camp in Iran. So it's, it's difficult to, um, exactly put into words what is in your mind and then you just let your hand do the talking or you take photographs. For example, there's an initiative called uh, Exotic Voices um, by a, a photographer named Reza and he went to an Iraqi refugee camp uh, in northern Iraq. The, uh, um, the refugees there are from Syria mainly and he gave each of the kids uh, um, cameras to photograph their everyday life. And uh, a 12-year-old girl named Maya Rostam, she uh, told him that this is a way for me to uh, show people what my life, how my life is. And then she proceeded to show him a photograph of her shoes that were frozen. And she had to wait before she could put them on. So that was her way of um, just putting it out there to the world of what her daily experiences are, and that is her normal, and that is not our normal. Um, but back to your question of how shape and form and color um, are reflected in my past, uh, I think it's, uh, it's a little difficult because in the architectural world we like to have this um, <laughs> ideal of we get to go design something and we put our own identity into it but it's actually serving the client uh, and that can happen through art but not necessarily um, entirely through architecture 
So our organization, when we um, built a child and community center this past year, uh, we tried to, again, give that voice um, in, in form, through form, through color, uh, back to the refugees um, that we worked with within the refugee camp. Um, although the, the, the form was a circular shape, a cylinder, a cylinder um, to kind of evoke this idea of unity and community and um, have people be able to gather in a circle and always um, remember that they are together. And that came um, out of my own, um, my own uh, experiences of you know, having rigid walls constantly and um, how a tent might feel uh, or just a room that we used to live in, all of us, um, five people in one living room. Uh, and that was our home for eight years. So how do you get past those, those walls, those rigid walls? And then um, the form of the circle came about. And then color, um, having something lively in a refugee camp. Uh, there's another project called the Zateri Project, which is in Jordan, um, in Zateri camp, where artists go and train children and they train um, the aid workers within the camp uh, to actually paint these elaborate murals that are full of color in a camp where there's no color everything is white or the blue from the UNHCR so you see these murals that are green and yellow and um, they have reds in them and they have the imprint of each refugee child and each um, adult, actually, they have uh, programs where the parents can engage with the kids and make these murals. So it's, um, it, it's a way to give them that voice and uh, something that they would otherwise not know. And a lot of kids who do suffer from PTSD um, because of the trauma that they've gone through uh, to get to the refugee camp have to um, use that medium to tell people how they feel or just as an outlet. Um, in the refugee camp that we worked in, I met uh, one kid who um, drew little uh, cartoons from his childhood when he was back in Mosul, uh, like um, what a Pokemon and I forget the other one, Yogi or something. <laughs> uh, I'm not very into that. But um, he, he would draw these amazing anime characters and he's a wonderful artist and that was his way of uh, expressing himself and showing his family what he could do and uh, wanting to make that into his career. So uh, art plays a huge role uh, and there's a lot of art therapy uh, within refugee camps. I hope that kind of answers your question. Eric. <laughs> um, I, I just want to make um, an observation or whatever and, and that's that there's levels of displacement like we were, you know, we're talking about. And we, we both talked about, um, you know, it didn't seem that bad or, or, or whatever, because that's part of the immigrant experience, that you're going to go forward and you're going to, you know, things are going to, um, but there's levels of it. Like, you know, I've, when you talk about some of these kids, you know, you're, you know, your heart just breaks, you know, and, and it all affects you, but, you know. Just personally, I mean, you know, I want to just, I don't know. But, but I, would, I would say that um, in, a, in a weird and strange and roundabout way, art, in a way, saved my life. Because my work is, is my, in, you know, it's sort of like therapy. It's sort of what I've been able to, to work things out at some level. And the, my wife will attest that plenty of times she would tell me, you need to go to your studio, like a bad little boy. But, you know, it, it just really, it really did. And there were moments when I was, you know, growing up and, you know, fourth, fifth grade or whatever, where teachers would give you some, you know, something to draw and I would, you, I would work through, through things. I mean, not that the level of some of these kids had to go through. But there is a, a redemptive quality to art, at least for me personally. And also remembering, like you, your parents did with you, uh, that, that there's beauty that exists that, that feeds your soul. So 
So I really want to open this up to you guys because we've been talking a lot and I have more questions if you don't have any, but I really want to stop and allow, allow you guys to ask some questions of the panelists. So, and I can walk around with a microphone to make it a little louder. Any takers? Hi, um, I'm Ophelia, and um, I am an Agnes Scott student. So I, I, we've had you um, at an adult in galleries. I recognize. Yeah. <laughs> so my question is uh, just because we had recently we had uh, Sophia Wallace. Uh, she is um, an artist that advocates a lot about um, the female empowerment and being able to be autonomous over your body. And she is a white artist. And so kind of this conversation that um, as I was walking around your gallery is it's very um, general and broad. So people from different cultures um, can come around. I am um, first generation um, Mexican American. And so I'm walking around, a lot of this kind of hits home to me, um, being a Latina. And just kind of, my question more along the lines is like, um, having in the art community, uh, talking about these topics, but who gets to talk about these topics? Because that's a really big controversy, because uh, we are so, I, th I personally believe as a society, we are so quick to say, no, you can't talk about this because you are, you are too privileged, or you are too underprivileged, or you are just X, Y, and Z. So how do you kind of go about that? Because this is your story, and you're telling your story, and versus a person that, you know. I, I I feel like I've been given so many labels and told what I can and can't do so much that um, you know I feel like an old steamer trunk you know it's got a thousand labels on it you just um, I, I believe that you should you know my parents came to this country so we have freedom to be able to, to say and do whatever we could so I believe that you anybody should be able to talk about ab about anything and it's a difficult thing, you know, it's, it's politically incorrect and stuff, but I wouldn't, you know, I'm old enough that I wouldn't let somebody stop me from talking about something if I wanted to talk about it. But um, I just think in the end we're all human, so there's certain things that, you know, maybe we don't know as much about. But maybe if we spoke up and we screwed up a little bit, maybe we might learn a little something from it. So, I mean, I. I've been to talks where, you know, certain groups say you're, you know, only so many people, you know, these people can write about it or whatever. But some of the artwork, you know, there's um, an Indian American writer named uh, Jhumpa Lahari, and she wrote a book, Unaccustomed Earth, I think it's called, and it's an amazing book, which talked about, you know, you know, being from two worlds and what that meant. And even though, you know, it was totally different, I could completely relate to it. Or there's Zora Neale Hurston, an African-American artist, and she wrote this incredible short story, Drenched in Light. I mean, and that moved me and whatever. And so I think that, he, like I said before, if, if an artist really reaches down deep and, and, and talks about something unique to you, it should somehow, maybe I'm being idealistic, but it should reach the universal, and that should be open you know, to everybody. When I was listening to your question, I was thinking a lot about um, who has a voice, right? I think that's kind of like at the heart of what you're asking. And uh, so not to, not to turn it into like a, a legal conversation, but I also have thought about this a lot from a, a legal perspective as well. Um, and just today I taught a class in my refugee law class on narrative. Um, because when people are applying for these types of relief within the law, the law requires us to put these stories, these like rich, vibrant, really amazing stories of people's lives into legal boxes, right? Like that is what the law really asks us to do. Um, 
And yet at the same time, we're telling a story, right? We're trying to be emotionally compelling and persuasive in order to try and seek relief for our clients. So um, when you asked your question, one thing that came to me, just because I've been thinking about this a lot lately, has been um, a tension, I think, within these statistics that David indicated about the number of global refugees. So one thing he didn't mention is that globally, more women than men become refugees, are displaced. And yet, globally, in all the countries where refugees find a home, are relocated, more men than women get asylum or are relocated. So what's going on there, right? And I think that's about who has access to a voice, right? Whose voices are being heard? Who's being marginalized along the way? Um, who has um, capacity to pay for an attorney? Who has resources? Um, so all of these questions, I think, um, are, are very, um, very much interconnected. And you know, I think the questions about voice and who has one, they, they play out in art, they play out in, in, in access to law and lawyers, which can be very important in, in survival for refugees as well. So forgive the legal riff on an artistic question. <laughs> So David's given me liberty to jump out of the world of art and back to the world of reality. This is today's edition of USA Today. I'll read the, the lead. It says, Dreamer is first to be deported under Trump. Now, dreamers are young people from other countries uh, that typically came uh, when they were under 16 years old, and they, under President Obama, were granted a protective status that granted them the ability to work here, go to school here, and have a driver's license, et cetera. This article is about the danger of a policy that is not applied carefully, is not applied individually, but is part of a hysteria for political reasons to collect as many humans as the government can and, take, and send them out of the United States. This young man, when he was stopped, happened not to have his papers on him. And that is not unusual. Many people we represent aren't carrying their green card, aren't carrying their work permit card. It, it's home. Why? Because it's safe at home. While they're out, it could be lost, stolen, or destroyed. In this instance, the ICE agents did not give the young man the opportunity under their custody to go to his home and show them his document. Instead, he was removed from the United States within 72 hours. Now, I think for most of us who are lawyers, we don't think these things really happen because our government tells us they cannot happen. The president, when he was a candidate, wanted to eliminate the provisions for the dreamers. When he became president, he completely reversed himself to the great happiness of many, many of us and said that those young dreamers will keep their status. He recognized the importance of them to our country. And then you wake up on a Wednesday morning in Buffalo and you read that article or in Atlanta and you just scratch your head and you say, how can this happen in America? He's not an artist, but you know what? It can happen to artists. It can happen to anybody. It can happen to a refugee from Pakistan, Afghanistan, doesn't matter where. When the government gives a license to its enforcement agencies to essentially go out and arrest people and deport them without giving them the benefits of representation by lawyers, of a day in court, the ability to tell some neutral party, I am a dreamer, I, I was approved. I'm in your system, sir, ma'am. Just check the database. And it didn't happen with this young man, and we know because of this, it's happening with other people, including artists. Anyone else in the audience have? All right, uh, you, got, you got more? Yeah. Do you, need, do you need the mic? No, I don't think so. I think everybody can kind of vocalize itself. Um, so, it's kind of like the question of like, what is the
completely vital, but at the same time, is at the, uh, was like, what are we as a community doing to do more outreach? Because coming here is a choice. Coming here is um, a privilege that I feel like a lot of people have. And a, to come here and have these conversations is a privilege. Um, that, um, for example, I personally, as a, I identify heavily with my Mexican culture. Um, and currently, I also have to carry my passport around. So it's one of those things that just like, it's really like, outside when we leave, so this is more like an insight rather than like a question. It's more like, when we leave here, don't stop the conversation, because that's, that's what happens every single So that actually um, leads me to a couple of questions that, um, and please feel free to jump in any time, any of you, this is totally a conversation. Um, one of the questions I had is, you know, what can we all do to support immigrants and refugees? And they, then maybe more specifically, if there are aspiring immigrant or refugee artists, how might we assist them in telling their story, changing the dialogue and so on. So I put that out there for the panel also and I actually have an answer to the question and I'll probably give the answer at the end which may be stepping out of my role as moderator, but thanks. Um, in regards of how we can uh, engage, further the conversation and go into the community, um, there are refugee neighbors, you have refugee neighbors, you have immigrant neighbors, uh, engage with them and see what they want, see what they need, um, or just to understand each other better. Um, we're all neighbors now. Uh, we're in this country together, so having um, more of an open heart and uh, open conversations and open dialogues with your neighbors. Uh, and you can go to Clarkston, the, one, the most diverse square mile. Uh, here, which is right in our backyard, and you can engage with uh, people who speak 50 different languages uh, and get to know them better and see what their struggles are. Uh, a lot of them suffer from PTSD as well because of where they've come from. Um, and a lot of them have this uh, really hopeful quality for, this, for their future. They, they see a brighter future and they keep working towards it. And as we all know, immigrants and refugees are entrepreneurs. Um, they have, they start businesses more than people who have been here for a very long time because we're all refugees aside from the native, or immigrants aside from the Native Americans. Um, so, they, but they are entrepreneurs. They have this hard work ethic. And going and saying, um, what do you need uh, to make this business happen? Because that's what a lot of people struggle with, whether you're actually just going to their restaurant, the Nepalese restaurant, um, Kathmandu in Clarkston, and contributing to their business by eating their delicious food, or you know, going to Refuge Coffee, where they train refugees um, to h how to engage in the workplace um, and have coffee and croissants. So, I mean, and it's, it's in those ways where we can really engage with the communities and um, participate and give them, show them that you actually care and you know that they're no longer outsiders entirely. And unfortunately, they do have to struggle with the hyphenated um, issue uh, of identity, but uh, you're no longer an outsider completely. You are a part of the society and just engaging um, with everyone is very important in giving them that voice and you're also your voice because they don't understand you uh, at all. So it, it goes back and forth. You know, I've got a plug I need to make. Um, so the Latin American Association this year, as, as, of la as last year, we have a, a high school art contest that we do focused on the undocumented experience. So uh, if any of you know any high schoolers who are aspiring artists that would like to uh, you know, sketch or paint about the undocumented experience here in the state of Georgia, there are scholarships attached to it. And to be honest with you, uh, a, a charity was very nice to give us those funds, but we use 
that artwork not only to support the education of uh, applicants who are typically young immigrants or refugees. In fact, the young lady that won first place last year was a Pakistani American. Uh, so not only does it have a, a very real benefit for the artist, it also gives us a chance to talk just like we're talking now. And I think the power of storytelling is something that has been lost in our culture of Twitter and bullet points. Mario, you and I were just talking about this, that the depths of the narrative has been lost. The conversations are no longer as deep as they should be. And we cannot dig underneath the problems that go very deep unless we have those very deep conversations. And so conversations like this around art, and art itself forces us to slow down and process, to slow down and ask questions, to interrogate the reality around us, to ask ourselves what should be, what ought to be, what is just, what is unjust, and how should we look at this different? So that's one opportunity. If you're interested, please see me after. I'll be happy to give you a card if you know a young artist that would like to do something like that. The other thing I would say is um, I think it's wonderful to go to the refugee community and, and to go and experience that. If for some reason you want a little more structure, you can also go to the nonprofits that serve them and, and sort of use that as a roadmap on what to do. Uh, I know for our side, we, uh, we had a, a meeting today with a coalition of refugee service agencies and apparently there's a plan to deport 4,000 Somalis and several were deported last week from Clarkston by ICE. And what occurred to me today is suddenly, you know, ICE used to be the Latinos community, Latino community's problem. At least that was a perception. Now it's everybody's problem. There's nowhere to run. And uh, I remember a quote by, by Nye Mueller, who was a pastor in the Holocaust that got um, interned in Dachau. And I, I remember the basic tenets of it was, you know, they came for the homosexuals and I said nothing. And they came for XYZ group and I had said nothing. And then they came for me and there was nobody left to say anything. So your question about speaking up, and Mario, I thought your response was great. We have to speak up. We have to talk. It's a lost art, <laughs> but it's time we got it back. So I just wanted to put that out there. Add a few, just this idea of like, how do we continue the conversation? Um, so, I have been since um, since the most recent presidential election. I've been on a lot of panels, um, a lot of people in a lot of different contexts, trying to understand like what is happening in terms of immigration law right now. Um, a lot of people who are confused, rightly so, and really worried, rightly so. And, you know, there's a lot that we don't know, but I do think that one thing that's really critical for um, those of us who are concerned about the ways in which some of the policies and laws that we're seeing in the front page of the paper may be motivated by anti, Muslim animus, anti-immigrant animus, anti-whatever group animus, um, I think it's critical that we name that. And I think art can be one way that we name that, but I just wanna, I wanna lay that out there from a legal perspective that, um, for example, this slew of executive orders that we saw in January, like, that's not normal. It's not within the realm of the legal norm. Um, no president has really done it in the same way, and I think that it's really critical that we name that and we um, state that explicitly if we feel that way. Um, and then just for people who are interested in thinking about ways to be involved, to um, contribute, learn more about the immigrant and refugee communities, I think there's a lot of different ways. Um, if people have language skills, I'll just say that that's something that lawyers, um, there's a lot of lawyers who are doing pro bono work and we're always looking for people to help doing interpreting um, for, for clients who we don't speak the language. Um, mental health experts, uh, refugees and immigrants have gone through a lot and can really benefit from that type of assistance and there are growing initiatives to try and train people who have that expertise so if you know people who are interested in in putting those skills to work and getting trained to help out refugees and immigrants um, I can help direct you to that 
Um, and, and lawyers, of course, there's, there's so many ways that lawyers can be involved, even if this is not their area of expertise. There are lots of trainings and ways that people can get involved. So um, if you know anybody who fits into any of those areas um, of expertise or has those skills, those are three things off the top of my head that I know I, as an attorney, am always thinking, I wish we had more, of, more people to help in those ways. Um, but also, you know, I know a lot of people who have had amazing experiences just adopting refugee families, right? Um, figuring out ways to, um, to build that personal connection. And I think that, that per those personal connections can be, can be really, really beneficial for families as they try and make their way. When a, when a family's resettled to the United States, you can speak to this, right now they get eight months of assistance in terms of financial assistance. And then after that, they're on their own find a job, figure it out. And I don't know if any of you have ever tried to learn a new language, but yeah. eight months, not a lot. Um, so there's lots of ways that I think that anybody can, can put some skills to use to try and uh, help out. The other thing you can do, <clears throat> in this state at least, is remember it wasn't but within the last two years that the governor expressed a desire that we no longer take Syrian refugees. Number one. Number two, that we cut back on the number of refugees we accept in Georgia. Now, Governor Deal wasn't alone. There were a number of Republican governors who did that throughout the U.S. And they did that for apparent political gain, short-term gain. And legally, they were not able to prevent refugees coming to their states. But the point is, the people of the state of Georgia and everyone in this room has the individual right to let the governor know that you don't agree with a policy that he takes. And when he comes out and he says that we shouldn't take Syrian refugees, or we should take less refugees, and if you believe that refugees are a positive for the state of Georgia, then you can do something very, very simple. You can write the governor, and you can get your family members, and your friends, and your neighbors, and like-minded people to do so. Uh, that's the sort of thing that all of us can do as individual citizens. And there wasn't much of that in the state, I think unfortunately. And the message that gets out federally is that Georgia is not a welcoming state. Atlanta is not a welcoming city. That's bad for all of us for all kinds of reasons. So again, something very simple. You can write the letter, you can write the email, you can make the phone call and have others do the same. We need refugees, we need immigrants, and if you believe that, then you have to make it part of your kind of daily fabric to do something, a letter to a congressman, a letter to a U.S. senator, a letter and email to the governor, once a week. Make it part of your routine. Many other states are sta safe havens, and are more people tending to go to these states? Um, yes, and lawyers advise immigrants if they have opportunities to go elsewhere, to go elsewhere. Um, the courts in Atlanta are notoriously bad for immigrants. The asylum grant rate in the courts in Atlanta is approximately 2%, um, and the national average is somewhere around 48, 49. So um, there's, there's a lot of reasons why, recently there was an article in the Huffington Post about, the title was, I think, Atlanta is the worst place in the country to be an undocumented immigrant. The largest number of people arrested in the last month in the country were arrested in Atlanta. We lead the country in those enforcement efforts. <laughs> 
So I think it's, it's a great question and uh, I should be clear that there's a distinction, that, an important distinction that we should make up front about the legal categories. Um, when we talk about the people who end up in immigration court, those are immigrants, people who don't, people who, <laughs> people who don't have status in the United States yet. Those are the immigrants that we're talking about who are in the courts. But refugees who are resettled here have gone through the process, a vetting process, a placement process overseas, a very, very extensive one with a lot of national security checks. And that, as Mark mentioned, is purely federal. That whole process is, is, is federal. Um, the president makes an annual determination as to how many refugees are resettled in the United States each year. And then, um, for example, last year it was 80,000. This coming year, it'll be capped at 50, if that. Um, and then, in terms of how they get to the different states, that's primarily through a number of different agencies that are contracted through the US government to help resettle refugees. It's, it's somewhat random, quite honestly, in terms of how those 80,000 people get herded out throughout the country. Uh, there has been an, in, in, an increased attempts to try and be more thoughtful about, for example, if a person is an Iranian refugee who is homosexual, should that person be resettled to Omaha, Nebraska? Or might that person be more successful in San Francisco? Right? Questions like that are starting to be taken into account, but that's true, and you can go back to when the Cubans came from Cuba in the 60s. Many were resettled into Miami, Chicago, New Jersey. But after the eight months, when your money's up, you're basically going to go wherever you've got family and friends. And so you'll see a second movement among refugees at the eight-month juncture, because there's no more money coming, there's no more support, they're gonna go where they have people. And that's been going on for many decades. So I had the opportunity to go to Clarkston and go through um, the formal refugee um, training program and I finished that and I went through the background check and that's completed. So I had the opportunity to kind of tour and get a little deeper peek into the tent, if you will, and I kind of um, saw some really interesting things. And one was the women were largely being trained to sew, which I question with automation today, what good are we really doing them, giving them that skill, teaching them that skill, correct? And then the men were bused up to North Georgia where our chicken farms are, and that's where they went to work. So you don't need to, to learn English when you're just given repetitive work, right? So my question is, from a um, social services standpoint, where's the pipeline for them to fully integrate into our society? Your story earlier about the gentleman who was a, a worker who needed to be um, receive bond to get out of jail in Columbus, right? There's so many stories like that and they contribute to society, they want to contribute to society, and those are the people we want in our society. They pay taxes and they contribute to the workforce. So what are we doing from a legal standpoint to provide the social services to bring them forward and fully ground them? Because it's their children right now who are telling mom and dad what to do because they know English. The parents don't. So how are we getting them into the system or into the, our society productively? I can't talk to the legal aspects, but um, in terms of the pipeline, there is none. There is no pipeline. Uh, a lot of, I know our parents, uh, as soon as we got here, at the time when we came, it was three months of um, wages. So. Uh, welfare and after three months they had to find a job and they worked in factories and now they're beginning to speak a little bit of English uh, more confidently but we had to pretty much translate all the time and there was no pipeline for them to uh, say what they want to do 
because there are no opportunities for someone who doesn't speak English and who has to find a job in three months uh, to live and feed their kids and stay in the apartment they've been given. Uh, so there, were, there was an ESL class at the church in Clarkston where they could t learn English, but you have to work at the factory from, you have to get on the bus and navigate that and then um, go to the factory that's like 45 minutes away and uh, work an eight hour to 12 hour shift at minimum wage and then come home. There's no time for ESL classes. Uh, there could be something on the weekends, but what are you going to do on the weekends? You're with your family finally. Um, you're going to go somewhere or do something else or just relax from the grueling work you've done in the factory all day uh, or all week and all of the stigma associated with that and working with people there who don't understand your situation. So I would hope that there would be a legal pipeline. Uh, I would hope that there would be other organizations that would help refugees um, say what they want to do uh, and actually give them that opportunity. It's great that it's eight months now. I guess that <laughs> it gives you a little five months extra time um, to do something, to go to English classes. But uh, again, like when we used to go to Newcomers Network, which, was, uh, which is now Refugee Family Services, it was the women learning how to sew, right? And um, the men were, oh, that's my sister, by the way, so <laughs> she knows. <laughs> Well, she commented on the, they cannot host enough training classes right now to handle all the volunteers that are coming through, which is really good, which is nice. So I think we've kind of landed on our hour. Um, I don't know if anybody else had any from the panel, are there any f parting comments? The audience, any any follow up questions, and I invite you all to kind of mingle and hang out at the end. But you do, it's great. <laughs> Mario is telling me to put in a plug for our organization. So, um, in addition to being full time designer and my sister is being uh, in information security, um, we also have a nonprofit which is a 501c3 called Design for Refugees, and we um, is purely crowdfunded um, and we work overseas in refugee camps and we primarily in Iraq but this year we applied for a grant to go to Sudan uh, because of the famine there so um, anything that any way you guys can help um, us achieve our goals and we we live by this mantra of empowering refugees to help us build and design uh, our previous project we actually had them uh, gave them wages of what any day laborer would make within that area to help us build um, the community center and we also have the idea of sustainability so all of our materials came from a about a two mile radius to the site we had the only waste we produced was from these plastic ties that we couldn't really burn but everything else was um, uh, reused recycled so we really want to empower refugees. We want to give them something back rather than imposing a product on them. So uh, our plan for Sudan is to go there, first of all, to document, it's in South Sudan, um, to document what's happening there because there's very little coverage of um, the situation. We all know that there's a huge famine right now. 
uh, they don't have enough food. Um, and then that's our first year goal with a documentarian um, from Germany. We're trying to get that together. And then um, over time, then we could begin to build these things. But first, engaging in the community and engaging with the people and finding what they need, rather than just showing up and saying, we're from America. This is what we think you need. So um, that's our first year goal. And then um, any type of help would be great. Thank you, Mario.